worship this morning according to the abbreviated communion service on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Old Testament lesson on this day of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, from the prophet Joel, chapter 2, beginning at verse 28. And afterward, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood 
for the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So far the Old Testament lesson. And our psalm of the day, these words of Psalm 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So far the psalm of the day. And our epistle lesson from Acts chapter 2 begins at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is written in the 20th chapter according to St. Luke, beginning at the 20th verse. <laughs> Keeping a close watch on Jesus, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. Teacher. We know that you speak and teach what is right, and that you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He saw through their duplicity and said to them, Show me a denarius, whose portrait and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he said there in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us join in confessing our faith this morning with the words of Dr. Martin Luther's explanation to the third article, as is printed within your service folder. I believe that I cannot, by my own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Our text today, our continuing study of St. Luke's Gospel from the 20th chapter. He said to them, Then give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Everyone wants a piece of me, says the man who's working two jobs and volunteering his time at the church and raising a family. I feel like Dr. Doolittle's push me, pull you, says the tired mom, chasing toddlers and playing Uber driver to the activities of her children and making a home. He thinks he's the only class we have to study for, says the frustrated student who has to read a Dickens novel, take a history science and a science test, and give 110% to his coach. You don't have to live very long, do you? To figure out that there are competing claims on our lives. Wife has a claim on her husband. Husband has a claim on his wife. The kids have a claim on both. And then the boss walks up to you on Friday afternoon and hands you what seems like a line right out of that office space movie. Well, uh, maybe I think you could come in to work on Saturday. That would be great, wouldn't it? We all understand the competing claims on our lives. The Jewish leaders who try to get Jesus out onto thin ice in this text, they use this frustration people feel over competing claims in order to put Jesus on the hot seat particularly the people of Israel, who were an occupied nation, felt these competing claims on their lives between Caesar and God. If you think about it, all of us live in this world of competing claims, and people who say that the Bible is not really relevant to some of their modern problems really haven't read it. It is incredibly modern. When you think of all the way from Daniel living under the heathen government of Babylon in far off captivity, to the weary Joseph taking his pregnant wife, Mary, south to Bethlehem to stand in long lines to register for Caesar's tax rolls, or to Paul trying to balance his Roman citizenship with his eternal citizenship in the kingdom of Christ. All of these different claims on our lives, but are they competing claims? Or are they complementary claims which must be distinguished? Here's how Jesus deals with it. Keeping a close watch on him, they sent spies who pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said, so they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. Well now, Jesus was often reviled and did not retaliate. But his enemies quickly found out that Jesus was not easily bowled over. He did not sit silently by and let the critics simply have their day. There are answers to what the critics have to say, and Jesus was good at answering them. It is the Pharisees and the Herodians who come to Jesus now. The Pharisees are Jewish to the bone. They care nothing for Caesar. The Herodians, on the other hand, as their name applies, are in cahoots with King Herod, who draws his paycheck from Rome. But politics makes strange bedfellows, as they say. 
And while these guys can't stand to breathe the same air, they are united, as people often are, in their opposition to Christ Jesus. And so they come to Jesus with a question. So the spies question him, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right. You do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? What you've got here, of course, is flattery. They ooze all over him with compliments about his fairness and his objectivity. and He doesn't show favoritism to anybody and so forth. And then they spring on him a question. Their timing of the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not, is critical. Passover is fast approaching. The blood of Jewish patriotism runs hot. Jerusalem is filled with Jewish pilgrims from all over the world. The Iron Legions of Rome are in town to keep order against any uprisings. The governor, Pontius Pilate, has commuted from his regular seat of government in Caesarea down to Jerusalem for the time of the Passover. It is amid all of these competing tensions that they come to Jesus with a question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not. They want to get Jesus out onto the thin ice of this question of where their real loyalty should lie. And of course, it was a problem for the Jews too. Loyal to God, but at the same time they could not deny that they lived under the Roman oppressors and that there were people they had to obey in this life. Paul, the apostle, understood the competing claims of living as a dual citizen, if you will. He was by birth Jewish of the tribe of Benjamin, as he himself put it, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. But because he was born in a free city called Tarsus, he was also from birth a free Roman citizen. But when you think about it, all of us, have dual citizenship. We are members of two kingdoms. We are members of any kingdom or country to which we currently owe allegiance or where we are born. But we are also by our baptism made members of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, bought with the blood of our Lord and Savior who lived, died, and rose for us. And so there we are. Citizens of two kingdoms, and we wonder about the competing claims that these kingdoms may have on us. So, for instance, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? These tensions have always been there, haven't they? I mean, a believer's relationship to the government under which he lives, and his obligations to that invisible kingdom that is more real than the air you can breathe, the kingdom we belong to by faith in Christ Jesus. These tensions that we feel have always been there when it comes to government in general, for instance. But when Paul writes about our obligations to the government in Romans chapter 13, he is surprisingly positive he really doesn't spill much ink, as it were, on bashing the powers that be. Whether it's a president, a king, a parliament, these are the powers, said St. Paul, that are ordained by God to keep order in this world. This power that the government has is not that of the gospel. There are two kingdoms in this world. One is that of Christ and the other is that of Caesar, the government. The government does not operate by the Bible. 
It operates by the law of force and natural reason, such as it is, even as it is polluted by sin. The church rules according to the gospel. Each kingdom is ordained by God. Each kingdom has a purpose. Each kingdom has its own tools. And neither fares well if it tries to borrow the tools of the other. And while it may be that we are often frustrated by the competitive nature of the government that always wants a piece of us, so to speak, we also know that we are given the government for our good and for our law and order in a world where not all people have faith. And truth be told, we subjects of government are also the beneficiaries of it. This dual tension that goes on we see in the life of a man like Daniel or his friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the Old Testament. Carried off into captivity in far off Babylon, they understand they are no longer living in a theocracy in Israel in a nation ruled directly by God in the Bible. They are now ruled by a man in Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. <clears throat> a government that is secular in nature, that often uses various religions only as political tools. When they are under this government, these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not rebel. As a matter of fact, they serve the government under which they live, and as the prophet Jeremiah told them, they seek the best interests of the country where they've gone to. They pray for the welfare of that state. So things may go well also for believers. In the midst of that government, they do not seek to establish by law the religion of the one true God. They do not seek to punish idolaters, worshipers of other gods by means of the sword. They do their very best to serve the country under which they live. If they are commanded to commit idolatry or some other sin that is contrary to the very word of God, they are willing to risk a fiery death rather than obey that command. We must obey God rather than men. These men in Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they understand the difference between these two kingdoms and what their obligations are. It is amid those kinds of tensions that the Jewish leaders come to Jesus and try to place him on the horns of a dilemma. Should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? They probably say it with a snicker because they know that if Jesus says, yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar, that he will be discredited in his Jewish patriotism among his followers. But if Jesus says no, they'll run right off and tattle to Pontius Pilate that Jesus is trying to undermine the Roman governor. And so they try to show these competing claims between Caesar and God and put Jesus between a rock and a hard place. As always, Jesus has a way of turning the question back on them. He saw through their duplicity and said, Show me a denarius whose portrait and inscription are on it. Caesar's, they replied. He said to them, then give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. They were unable to trap him in what he said there in public. And astonished by his answer, they became silent. The all-knowing Christ sees through their duplicity, their two-facedness, their hypocrisy, and with one back at him, he says, show me a denarius. In other words, the currency, the coin of the realm, the existence of which and the use of which demonstrates a government's control over its people. One of them reaches in his pocket and fishes out a coin, a denarius. On that denarius, would have been an image. Tiberius Caesar, it said, son of the divine Augustus. 
I mean, when you think of it, how hypocritical is this? These guys are worried about idolatry or service to a heathen power, and they're carrying in their pocket this graven image on a coin of Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. Jesus says, whose portrait and inscription are on it? Caesar's, they reply. And he has them pinned to the mat. You carry in your pocket a coin that is minted by Caesar. You use that currency to buy things. You acknowledge the coin of the realm as an authority over your lives. You travel on roads built by Caesar. You are protected on those roads by soldiers of Caesar's legions. You seek justice in Caesar's courts. You use Caesar's public buildings and services. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Now well, that tension runs high in any age. Political views may run red hot, but as we said, we payers of taxes are also beneficiaries of the government. We pay our money into the system, but then we also expect that we shall get back countless services, better roads, pensions, health care, education, police protection. A standing army fully armed. The list simply goes on. There are some things that belong to Caesar. And there are some things that belong to God. We have our obligations for all the faults of these human governments. For all the corruption that exists. And what government will ever spend your tax money as wisely as they ought. It's a broken, sinful world. It ain't going to happen. But they are nonetheless, said St. Paul, God's servants. They may not know it. They may not understand it or care about it. But they are his servants. In order to keep law and order in this world, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Unless... Caesar commands that which is contrary to God. To God, what is God's? Sometimes there are things that do not belong to Caesar. Sometimes the claims of God on your life and the claims of Caesar on your life not only compete, but they conflict. There are things that Caesar can demand of me. Others he cannot. For the early Christians, it was whether or not they should throw a pinch of incense on the altar and say, Kaiser Curious, Caesar is Lord. Or whether at the cost of their very lives, they should cast a pinch of incense not on that altar and instead say, Christus Curious, Christ is Lord. And for that they paid with their blood. There are things that may belong to Caesar. Caesar may command my money. Caesar may command my life in times of war for the protection of my country. But Caesar may not claim my faith, my heart, my conscience. Caesar may not claim my conscience nor my pulpit. Some things belong only to God. So give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but to God what is God's. Because some things and some loyalties belong only to him. We ourselves, we live in a society which increasingly 
wants us to conform to the thought police of either the government, the media, or the celebrities that accuses Christians who oppose homosexuality, living together without marriage, abortion, who maintain Christ is the only way to heaven, and that the Bible is the word of God, that these things are hate speech. My conscience and my pulpit do not belong to Caesar. They belong to God. So does your life. Whose mark and image do we bear? In the beginning, the Holy Spirit stamped his image on us, the very likeness and image of God. We lost that image through sin. Now, by the blood of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, through baptism and the means of grace, has marked us and stamped us with His likeness, with His image. The Augsburg Confession says, the power of the church and of the civil power must not be confounded. St. Paul said in Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. That's a neat way to look at your life, isn't it? You are on temporary foreign soil here. You have another kingdom that will never pass away. You belong to an eternal kingdom that no one can take from you. And you have been stamped by the Holy Spirit and His claim is on you. The Holy Spirit, by the blood of Jesus, does not want a piece of you. He wants all of you that there is. When he has that, all the other pieces will fall into place too. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us offer up a prayer of thanks on the occasion of the 30th wedding anniversary of Mike and Marilyn Johnson. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants throughout the 30 years of their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them so that their love for each other may never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to each other and to you, their God and Lord. Encourage all husbands and wives as they seek to fulfill their marriage promises and bless all our homes with your abiding peace. Amen. We also pray, Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the communion portion of the service, beginning on the top of page 23 in the front of the hymn. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
page E. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death all your sins. Page E. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior. Thank you. 
depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this Holy Supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace.
for several years now, ever since it became clear that the NIV, New International Version 1984, would no longer be available or for sale, and that there were some concerns about the direction of the NIV 11 and its subsequent revisions coming up. But due to that, uh, a project was started called the Wardberg Project. Over 100 Wells Pastor professors and lay people uh, worked on this, uh, and you have been hearing updates on it for some time. Today, at the door, you will receive a free copy of the <coughs> New Testament and Psalms newly published. The Old Testament, along with the complete Bible, will be published, God willing, in September of 2019, a little over two years from now. Uh, you may take a free copy, uh, one per household, please, but if you have a friend or there's a chuggish you can come and you benefit from this, go ahead and make it. There's a Bible reading schedule in there, 90 days through the New Testament. If you want a summer project, look it over, enjoy it, and may God bless it. Please read each other.